appreciate your being here tonight for our spring 2023 artist Wingate in resident Jamel Wright's work and his studio talk this evening. We're delighted to have him here, delighted to have you here. Uh, we began the Wingate Artist Residence Program in 2021, and we've had artists Amy Pleasant and artist Anthony Goykalea from New York, and our own Dante Hayes, a graduate from one, one of our programs in ceramics and printmaking. I think he was a dual major at the time, and now we have Jamel. Our interest is presenting to you an artist who works in uh, multivalent ways, multivalent capacities, work that is interdisciplinary that can inform students across several dif disciplines and to engage and to teach and to be in studio making things. It's, it's rare that students have the capacity to watch artists actually working. I love it when faculty actually set up something in the easel and they make work along with students it's the best kind of teaching. And to have uh, the blessing of the Wingate artist in residence, it's, it's been terrific here. Uh, Jamel and Dante Hayes will have a show here this summer as part of uh, the annual Artists uh, in Residence program. Uh, that's a summer show every year. And uh, we conclude the Artists in Residence program in 2024, we are hoping to have that renewed by the Wingate Foundation. Uh, they've been impressed with what we've done so far, and we're certainly impressed and delighted with the artists that we've had on campus. Um, I want to mention that next year is the 10th anniversary of the Zuckerman Museum of Art, which is really hard to believe. Uh, it's going to be featured uh, in 2024, spring 2024, both galleries will feature a 10th anniversary exhibition of the permanent collection here. And, uh, and it's going to be a teaching opportunity as well as just a time to celebrate and look forward and look past simultaneously. We're very excited about that. So I'm going to have our amazing and visionary coordinator of our new BFA in textiles and surface design, the studios in which Jamel is working right now, uh, introduce Jamel. Uh, Professor Amanda Britton, she is amazing. If you've ever had a chance to take a class or see what she's doing in the textiles program, you really need to see it. She's a good one. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Gio, for your introduction. Um, and thank you guys for joining us tonight. I'm so excited to um, get to introduce my new friend and fellow artist, um, Jamel Wright Sr. Um, I told Jamel that um, I was gonna tease him a little bit uh, about his obsession with prints. Um, so I'm excited to see, maybe he'll give us some uh, Prince dance moves that we got in the studio the other day um, um, on his way up here. Um, so anyways, a little bit about Jamel, um, and I have, I usually do not have a scripted thing, but I'm a little scatterbrained today, so we're going to read off of this. Um, so Jamel graduated from Georgia State University um, with a BA in Art History and an MFA from the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, New York. Um, his work has been exhibited across the United States in various solo and group exhibitions. Recently, um, he's completed a residency at the Gibbs Museum in Charleston, South Carolina, as well as a residency at the Hambridge Art Center in North Georgia. Concerned with black American vernacular experience, Jamel's work creates conversation between family, tradition, the spiritual and material relationship between Africa and the South. Utilizing found objects and materials, Georgia clay, indigo, Dutch wax cloth, Jamel's practice is charged with energy, color, and deeply inspired by the great migration of black Americans. Um, currently working as the 2023 Wingate um, Artist in Residence, Jamel has been creating works within our textile studios, which is over on the Marietta campus. Um, he has interjected a bright enthusiasm into our student critiques and studio, studio culture. Being open to new textile processes, Jamel and I have been working together in our state-of-the-art brand new dye lab, weaving studio, and <laughs> <laughs> digital st um, studio spaces. Um, he's interested in exploring process, sur surface manipulation, and color, um, and it's been such a wonderful opportunity for our students and staff um, to observe and share the studio spaces with him. 
We are both excited and eager about the series of works he's going to complete within this residency. Thanks, Jamel. Um, first, I would like to thank everyone for being here, but more so, I would like to thank Amanda for being so generous with her time and teaching and my fellow students that are there that are open to me blabbering out stuff. Uh, come into the Die Lab when I'm listening to old school hip hop and not being offended. Um, and just uh, being really open, being really open. Um, I wanna thank Gio um, for your generosity again, and Elizabeth, and of course Cynthia for um, uh, heading this program and doing so many dynamic things with it. Um, Emily Knight, who's not here, who is probably one of my patrons at heart, um, has been so helpful to me. So I really love uh, the Kennesaw campus and what it means not only to me as an artist, um, but also including the Atlanta artists all the way up here in Kennesaw. <laughs> so um, before I get started, I like to tell a little bit of my story. And I, I do this because I think that um, for those that are non-traditional artists and for those that are young artists to understand that it's all a process. So when I, I was 32 years old, I was laying on my sofa and I was looking up at the ceiling and I had been a waiter for a number of years and um, I just decided one day that I was gonna listen to my mother <laughs> and I was gonna go to school and I looked at my watch and I said, it's five o'clock. I said, okay, they're probably closed today. So tomorrow I'm gonna go down there and I'm gonna apply. And I applied that next day. And then from applying that next day, I then had to, um, um, I didn't realize the process was so fast because I had applied at the end of spring semester and I didn't realize that. And um, I thought, okay, well I'll apply now and then I'll start in the fall. I ended up starting that, that summer with 97 math, like the lowest math. And it took me 13 years to graduate. I had to, I had two additional children. I had a divorce. I had a new relationship. I had a breakup. I had um, a gallery. I had more waiting tables. I had all of that. And then I finally graduated at 45 years old with an art degree. I had to learn French at 44 years old, which young minds don't understand, but older minds understand that was probably the biggest accomplishment out of all of it. Um, but I had to learn French at 44, 43, 44 years old. So um, I graduated at, 40, at 45, and then I had to make a decision on what I was gonna do next. I decided, well, I mean, let's roll the dice and see what happens, and I applied to four grad schools, and um, Georgia State, um, VCU, Yale, and um, SVA. SVA came with the scholarship. So my dad always says, you go where the money goes. So I, I went to SVA. Now for a 45-year-old man with four children leaving Atlanta, Georgia, to move to New York for two years for grad school sounds like a dream. Right, it sounds like the, you, you just could imagine that everyone here, my mother and my exes are all encouraging me to go. No, um, but I felt like they didn't like me anyway, so they couldn't like me any less. So I figured I'd just go ahead and go anyway. And I went and I rolled the dice and I spent two years in New York grinding. And when I say grinding, I'm talking about grinding. Um, you gotta be rich to be broke in New York. And, um, I was used to living a 45-year-old lifestyle, and I had to go back to a 20-year-old lifestyle. Um, but I made a promise to myself that I was going to be a monk in the Monastery of Art for those two years. And uh, I shouldn't have said that. I should have said I was going to be in the, the rich part of, <laughs> of art for those two years, because I, I really was in the monastery. And I say all that as an encouragement to young artists that you know, you just have to do it. You have to just do it. Because if you listen to a lot of things that people are gonna say, they're never gonna say the most encouraging thing. You have to decide for yourself. You have to choose it. So with that, 
This right here is my inspiration. This is the um, SP1200. It is the tool that's used for sampling. It is what changed music. It is what changed our lives. Everything that you are listening to on the radio right now is influenced with this machine. What is done and how it's influenced us is by being able to take seven seconds of a song and looping it over and over again. Taking a sample of a song. That sample of a song is what we now call hip hop. You're right though, because it did remix. It took old songs and made them new all over again, and people began rapping over them. It, the, the drum in there, the 808, eventually the 808 drum is what inspired bass and changed the way that we listen to music, but it also changed the way we thought about most things, right? And it changed the way that I think about um, my art making process. I am a product of my parents, and I'm sampling that life. Uh, with my first painting, uh, this is going home number 16. The, my first year in grad school, I completed 22 pieces, nine feet by six feet pieces. When I first walked in, um, my mentor at the time was Miguel Luciano. And he's, um, I said, I want to do this, and I want to do this, and I want it to fold like this, and I want this. And he was like, uh, is this one of your paintings? And I said, yes. He goes, how about this? How about we focus on making a good painting first? <laughs> <laughs> I never forget that. Because whenever I start a series, I always think first, let's think about making a good one first. Right? So. That year, I made um, 20 pieces. Um, I was using Canvas. I then learned um, that I was creating this thing that, it was the year of Michael Brown. And I was thinking about ideas of where can black people go to feel safe. So that's why I was entitled Going Home. I felt like if you stood in front of these pieces and you maybe did a dance or sang a song, right? then um, you'll be transported into this magical place where suddenly you will feel safe. Where Michael Brown was in a situation where he was murdered and then left in the street for four hours. And I, at the time I thought about my son who um, was a young man at the time and fearing for his life, fearing for my life, right? Um, and then I said, okay, well this abstraction that I'm using is this Western idea of abstraction. Let me add something that I believe would be African. So I then took this um, Dutch wax cloth and began sewing it together. Well, I must preface first that I did not know how to sew before I went to grad school. I then set up an appointment with the Futures Lab, went there, and they taught me how to sew on a juki. On a juki. I took, they said, okay, you got two pieces of fabric, put them together, put them through the machine. I did one. They said, okay, do it again. I did a second one. I said, okay, I can do this. The third one. And then after a while, I was like, okay, I can do this. Then I took the two, made it four, took the four, made it eight. I'm like, okay, I can do this. So technically, I only knew how to sew at 45 years old. Um, I began sewing that, and then I hand sewed, stitched that to the surface of the painting, and then I thought that I was combining this thing that was American and that was African. And because of those two things, and then I added red clay. Why do I use red clay? I use red clay because I believe that, um, that it is magical. Um, many people in the South thought of red clay when they would, um, pregnant women who were African descent would use the red clay and eat it at times because it supplied minerals that they couldn't get from the food. Um, also, the red clay has a mineral in it that kind of sparkles a little bit. Um, and if you think about the Great Pangea and you put the whole thing back together, then Africa and America, the same place where it has red clay, is the same place that has red clay in Africa. So I thought of it as, as this magical land bridge that was happening between um, the, uh, Afri the American South 
and Africa, which led us back. So in, in proposing this idea of performing in front of this piece that it would transport you somewhere home, I felt like it had all the minerals necessary to, to do that. This was the second one. So you can see that in the very beginning, I am still thinking about this idea of draping. Um, draping was really important because what I know, what I like is back step. I, before I went to grad school, I used to sit down and watch Project Runway with my daughters. I, I don't care, I'm okay with it. Um, but I would sit down and watch it with my daughters. We would discuss you know, the different outfits and I was currently working in, in wood um, some of you know that, and I was working in wood, but I couldn't get it to bend the way that they, they could bend the fabric, and I was just kind of like in love with the idea that these patterns, when they crossed over each other, that they would not be a, the same pattern anymore, that they would kind of, the patterns would break, right? Um, and then it becomes something else. And then if you're painting over, the, then they become distress, right? So. I thought that draping this fabric and draping this painting would kind of give this illusion that only was it in motion, but also the pattern that is in my head was then broken organically, right? And I was thinking about these ways of breaking patterns. This fabric, we think of it as, we call it a Dutch wax fabric. So this Dutch wax fabric is honestly not from Africa. Many times we think of it as being African, but it's from Holland. And it's petite, which means that it is, um, it is made from, um, uh, it's made in Holland, they dye it, they manufacture it, and at first it was sent to Malaysia. Malaysia did not really fully accept it, they began making their own, then they began selling it to Africa. When they begin selling it in Africa, Africa begin to adapt it so much so that now we think that it's an African fabric, which going back to the idea of sampling, it, it continues that idea, right? That someone has given you something and then you turn it into something else and you make it as your own. I begin using these pouches. These pouches were um, symbols of the uh, gris gris bags. During the Great Migration, um, many African Americans would travel from the travel from the 1920s and 1970s. They traveled from the South to the North in hopes of change, but they would carry these little pouches with them, and these pouches contained like um, an amulet, um, uh, chicken foot, rabbit's foot, something they thought was good luck, maybe a, a, a mother's ring, and they would say uh, that. Like even Muddy Waters has this song where he says, I got a Johnny Cockeroo, I wanna mess with you, right? He's talking about that Gree Gree bag and he's carrying that with him. He believes this gives him good luck. So I begin making these pouches, creating these pouches, um, putting uh, my clothes in them, starting off putting my clothes in them, old clothes that I was wearing, or clothes that I was getting rid of, that I felt they would carry good energy to them, right? I was wearing them in the studio, I was um, consuming myself with art, art practice, I was dancing, I was singing, and doing one of my most favorite things in the entire world is smoking a cigar. <laughs> um, and I'm doing that in these shirts. So I felt like these were good, good feelings, right? So when I put them in these pouches and hang them on the wall, and then when you begin to hang them on your wall, then they become these power items. Right? They're now charged with an energy, right? They're charged with the love that I have for my children, the love I have for my family, the love that I have for art making. They're charged with my love I have for Prince and the love of a wonderful cigar. Um, so here you see in transit number two. This was the second one I created. This was after I had a, a conversation about the, the fabric with an artist here. He came up to visit me, Michi Miko. He came up um, and came to my studio and we were talking about the other pieces and he says, you know, you seem to be really in love with this fabric, the textile, why don't you just go with that? And I'm like, I've been thinking about it but I'm not really sure and I was like, like man, I, I think you should. 
So I tried it, which was one of the hardest things I had to do because when you see this fabric, especially the textile department, it's so beautiful, right? And to think that you're actually gonna paint over it was, uh, was a challenge, was an idea that I had, but it was, um, it kind of took like, I felt like it took some nerve to really paint over something that was already beautiful. And I wasn't really sure if I was gonna make a good painting yet. I did. I say that I did because um, it took me a, a while to figure out how to form these. At first I was thinking about draping them on the floor or putting them in the corner. And then after, after um, winter break in my last semester of grad school, before my last semester, I decided to go over to the Whitney. I will tell you, as I was talking to you the other day, that going someplace where you have lots of experience to um, see art in its practice is probably the most valuable things you can do for yourself. Spending those two years in New York, uh, SVA gave me a free pass to the MoMA, and the Whitney, the Met was pay as you wish, the Brooklyn is pay as you wish, so you really have an a la carte. I was four blocks away from the, blue, the major blue chip galleries of the world. Um, David Zwerner, Gagosian, Pace, and you are going to these galleries because they're almost like museums. And you're able to see exhibitions for two or three times just by walking to them. I say that because I went to the Whitney after that um, winter break um, and I couldn't figure out what it is I didn't like about what was happening with my work. I didn't like the way it looked. I had painted the room. I'd done all these things and I just didn't like it. And it just was, I was unsettled. So I said, well, bump it. I'm just gonna go to the Whitney. So I always believe that going into museums and going to galleries, this is our research as artists. Lawyers go to libraries, doctors go to seminars, artists go to museums. Anywhere I go, the person I'm with knows we're going to a museum. I have to research. Um, so I went to the Whitney. I go up to the third floor where all of my teachers are. Um, and I say teachers, meaning that older artists are our teachers. If you stare at the work long enough, you're gonna learn something. I went up, I walk, I walk in, and when I walked in, I turned the corner to my left, and there he was, my teacher, Clifford Stills. I saw a 10 foot by 10 foot Clifford Stills. And when I saw that painting, I knew everything that was wrong with what I did. White walls. I had done everything to be complicated, to make it into something that it wasn't. I tried to add all these gimmicks, and it's never that. It's just about the work. If the work can't stand on its own, then it's not good. You need to go back. If you have to talk about your work too much, if you say longer than a paragraph about your work, you have not put it in the work. Put it in the work. So with that being said, I, I did this piece. And once I did it, I was like, I got it. I got it. This is my mother and my Aunt Sylvia. My mother at age of 14, she moved up to, from Birmingham, Alabama with my grandmother to go to um, Columbus, Ohio. At the age of 14, during the Great Migration, my Aunt Sylvia, at the time, she had lived in Columbus with my Uncle Lee, and she, my mother used to go up during the summers and babysit uh, my cousins. Um, and then my grandmother uh, moved in with them, taking my mother with her. And then I was born in Columbus, Ohio. I am a product, a direct product of the Great Migration. This is my father. This is Jim Wright. Um, Jim Wright was bo also born in Birmingham, Alabama. They met in Columbus, Ohio. They're 13 years apart. They found out in Columbus, Ohio, they actually lived 20 minutes away from each other in Birmingham, Alabama. He was in the military. He then went to Central State University in Dayton, Ohio. Well, it's Wilberforce. It's right outside of Dayton. Um, and he eventually met my mother. I am a direct product of the Great Migration. 
You'd be amazed on how many people come from the Great Migration, like John Coltrane is from South Carolina, Miles Davis, his parents are from Arkansas. Like there are so many African Americans that come from the South moving to the North in, in hopes of opportunity that at one time, it, it, well actually it's called the greatest migration ever in the world of, African, of the Great Migration. So all the things that we benefit here in America was because these Southerners moved there. I'll even go more recent, Nas's parents, um, Nazir Jones, the rapper, his father's from Mississippi. You know, Jay-Z, I think his parents are from um, South Carolina, his grandparents from South Carolina. So this migration is, is bringing these different things together, these different elements together. So oftentimes when people think of my, when they think of what I'm making, they think of it as quilting, but I call it sampling because I'm taking these different fabrics. I'm taking the fabrics from a, a friend who makes dresses. I'm taking fabrics from um, those that I'm using to fill in and I'm sewing them together. And then I'm using the opposite side, not the clean side, the quilting side. I'm using the opposite side with all the mistakes, with all the, the blemishes where it's frayed on the end. And that makes it a little bit more sculptural. And that, and that took time to develop rather than just doing the easy thing of doing the the um, the clean quilted side. This is where it all came together. I was on the train because I was working at the Met for the summer, and I had to had to get up at eight thirty in the morning. Well, actually, I had to get up at like six. I had to be at work at nine. I am not a morning person. I'm not. I'm not. I don't understand why people wake up before 10 a.m. If you do, God bless you. But I just don't think that if, if God meant for me to be up before 10 a.m., then he would have processed my body to do so. And I don't think there's anything that's happening after 10 a.m. That couldn't, that couldn't be done after 10 a.m., right? Like, all these people that get up at 6. I mean, you can still do that at 10 a.m. I mean, why force me to be you? Be you, I'll be me. So I would have to get up at six o'clock in the morning because the train took an hour and a half for me to get from Jersey City over to the Met and then you never know how the train's gonna work that day. So it's best that you just give yourself an extra 30, 40 minutes. Um, so I would be on the train. And the train, you start learning these things where you put both earpieces in, both earbuds in, and you kind of zone out and you learn how to look at people without looking at them, which is an amazing thing. For a Southerner, it's one of the hardest things you'll have to learn how to do. Because we're used to going, hey, how you doing? And they're looking at you going. <laughs> so I had to learn to give like this stare like. So, but being on the train first thing in the morning, you're so jam packed in there. I mean, sardines is, you're closer than sardines. You're so close to people that you're asking yourself, is this a violation of human rights? Like it's just, because we're so used to space here, like even you have a chair between you. It's not like that in New York. It's like the, you are the chair between them, right? So um, you're so packed in, I begin to see different things. And I begin to see how these colors come together. So what you're seeing um, in that one is my very first, the, the, the one furthest to the left is my very first um, observation. And that is, I noticed how her earrings matched the pink in her, the shirt matched the pink on her um, fingernails, her brown complexion. The guy behind her with gray and his um, peach complexion, or lighter peach complexion. And that gray, that black line as his backpack, his hairline, all those things, that, the measure of his face. And I began seeing that the people disappeared. And then it just became line, color, shape, and form. And then in the summer when I didn't have a whole lot of money to make artwork, I created an Instagram called Art Found Photo which was my, these kind of observations where I was making color, line, shape, and form decisions. 
And then that's how I begin to think about not only the way I draped, but the way that I put pieces together. That was just allowing things to happen organically rather than trying to force things to happen. Um, I think that by us forcing art to happen, making something that shouldn't be, I think that eventually the viewer will see it, right? They'll be able to see through it. So it just has to be, has to come direct from you. This is my grandmother's house. From this house is where I also learned abstraction because I sat on that porch many a days from the age of six years old to probably about 15 when my grandmother passed, where my parents would say, uh, they would want to talk and like, Jamel, go out there and uh, count train cars. <laughs> you know, at six or seven years old, like, yeah, I'm gonna go count train cars. <laughs> and meanwhile, they are just having their great conversation and like, I just counted 100 cars. Great, go count some more. Yeah! And I'm running out there, they paint train cars. And I would just sit on that stoop and I would see the train go by. And it'd be 100 cars, sometimes 102 cars. For real, like no exaggeration. You count 102 cars, but you're counting those different colored cars in front of those houses with trees behind them, the sun going down behind it, and all those colors. And then you begin to see the train in motion, the house in front of it being still, the trees waving, that green, and then orange, purples, yellow behind it and you begin to see color. You know when I was coming and then the house was like this kind of weird green like this, like you would have to make this green. Like this green, I know where you find this green. If you go to Home Depot and go to the oops section, that's the color green this house <laughs> is, right? Because it's not a real color that you would say, yeah, I want that one. It's this imaginary color. But sitting on that stoop, I learned so much about like peace and, and quietness and being able to appreciate quietness and feeling that summer dew because it would be hot in Alabama. I mean, it's not fair <laughs> how hot it would be. Like you would say, God, does it really need to be this hot? I mean, what are we killing at this point? There you can see maybe a little bit of the color of the house. That's a young Jamel with that fancy haircut over there. I was from a Piku before he was. And that's my sisters, my brothers, my dad, my mom. And this was number eight of that year. This is how I finished my year at uh, SBA. But I think now that you've seen those other things, maybe you can help to understand this a little bit more. But this is the very early stages where I didn't have some of the aperture ideas to hang the work. This is in the very beginning when I was still figuring out how to hang it and um, who was gonna hang it, right? Because if I was the only one that knew how it was hung, then whenever it went to a museum, no one could really copy that. So my professor also gave me that charge. He says, well, who's gonna hang this? How are they gonna hang it? If you're the only one that knows how to hang it, I said, well, I'll go there and hang it every time. He said, no, you need to think of a way to, to hang it. So I said, fine. So I went back and I went to the streets of Jersey and I was finding all this wood because in New York they have a lot of these old apartments and they'll just um, redo an apartment. Like you redo a house, which I never understood. It's an apartment, like why would you redo it? But, but anyway, so they would do that, and I would find all these pieces of wood, and I actually found that broom one day, and I drove past it once. I said, if it's still there when I come back, I'm getting that buddy. So, and I did. Um, but I figured out, like, how to drape that fabric onto that wood. Um, I've always been fascinated with the Nikizi pieces of the Congo, the nail, what they call nail fetishes, the power items. Um, and I think of my work always as that. These are kind of deconstructed versions of that to some degree where I'm using the nails, um, there's actually mirror at the very bottom of that, and I'm using the fabric and this string that is coming off of that. So that string is also the same string that you would see around those um, power items. Um, 
I also call them like formal investigations. Um, I use them as like I call ab I call it abstract math um, because you have to find the balance between color, line, shape, and form in all of them, and each one of them gives you a different problem. Um, and I love problems. I love solving these problems. I love hanging this piece in the studio for four or five days until I figure out what's the next move. And it doesn't always tell you what's the next move. This one, I actually, that circle that you see in the middle of it, I discovered that when I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art again to look at artwork, and I saw op uh, Opolis from the exhibit talking about the popes, that was about the pope's clothes, and they had this one piece of jewelry from one of the, pope clo uh, from one of the popes, and it was an Oculus or something, it was a circle, and I saw it, and they said, don't take pictures of anything, and I was like, boy, you talk a lot, click. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but once I saw it, I knew what was missing in this piece. I knew that it, at that point, I knew this needed something cut out of it, but I only could have figured that out if I had gone to the exhibition. That's why going to exhibitions is important. Um, so here, again, is figuring out where the line goes, where the shape goes, where the mirrors go, allowing mistakes to happen or things that you think are mistakes but actually fall right into place. Um, there on that piece of wood that's going on the, on the side right there, there's actually a spider web on it, and I just won't touch it um, because I think it deals with the materiality of the work and allowing something to be. Um, I don't know if any of you ever heard of Wabi Sabi. Wabi Sabi is a philosophy about naturally distressed items and, um, and allowing things to be and almost finding more beauty in something that's broken than something that is perfect. Um, we are all broken to some degree. Except for young people, you're not, you're not broken, you're perfect. Don't believe that. Uh, these are bundles. When I came back to Atlanta, I, um, I was broke. And being 47 years old, being broke is not a fun thing to be and then having to drive home from um, New York, Jersey, um, that is a two-day travel, being broke is not a fun thing to be, but gas prices work what they are now. So I bought $50 for my mother, and I packed everything in my truck, and I came back, but I had so much stuff in my truck, you don't realize how much stuff you accumulate in two years, including my art pieces. Like, I was literally like rolling down the window and stuffing things in to the car to make sure I was taking it with me. So when I got home, I was asked to do an exhibition called uh, Little Things, Small Things, that was at Coach House. And um, Marianne, I had asked Marianne like, what was going on in the city, and she said, well, I'm doing this exhibition of Small Things, why don't you get in it? And again, I still didn't have any money, so I still had these broken pieces of wood. And I had, uh, there was a house that had been abandoned and they tore it down not that far from me. I still had some of this fabric together. And I began putting these things together. I found these toys. There was a, um, what was it, a, a daycare center that had burned down not that far from me as well. And I went there and gathered up all those toys. Yes, I'm one of them. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care what you think about me. I'm making art. So I found all these toys, and I began putting it all together. And as I began putting it all together, it became like the the other items that were uh, chairs to remnants of home, but they were these smaller versions. They were these more compact versions. And I thought of them in the same way that I was moving from Jersey. Like if someone was moving in the middle of the night, as many African Americans were doing during the Great Migration, because they were leaving the South in droves, that they were leaving these plantations, these crop sharing situations, and they're leaving without, leaving these people without anyone to work these farms. So they had police that would be stationed at the train stations to, make, to force people to go back home. So those people had to escape. They had to leave in the middle of the night. And I just think, like, if I had to carry something for 400 miles walking, I, it wouldn't be a whole bunch of luggage. It would be just the things that matter. And they would just be in this small little 8 by 8 by 8 shape. I could put on a stick, put on my shoulder, 
maybe carrying my back. I mean, those are brave people to leave a situation, to go somewhere that you don't know if you're going to be successful. Those are brave, brave people. So I call them bundles. So they, they have gloves in them. They have um, string. They have the, the, the gree gree bags because I wanted them to still contain that power. I still wanted them to contain those elements of uh, good, uh, good energy. And then in transit. So you saw in transit number two, and now this is in transit number 18. I learned so much in that time period. I learned how to use the aperture. Like I figured out that if I put canvas on the back and then sewed it to the canvas, that would keep it in shape. And you guys, Gio, Elizabeth, you saw that when we hung this, that when you first looked at it, you was like, oh my God, how am I gonna be able to hang this? And I said, it's gonna be easy. Yes, it was easy then, but at number three, number four, it was not easy. But by number, after finishing transit number 18 and figuring out like sewing it to the surface and having that, um, that canvas on the back, how well it just hung on its own. Um, and then I was able to do uh, Reborn number four here, which is also in the PowerPoint. But I learned that the strings, I started adding these longer strings in them. These strings were, like if you look at the Orishas, which is the African gods, then you would see like small filaments over their head. Um, I began to think of those strings coming off, not only as an additional line, but also as um, halos around the work. So constantly pouring into this work these good things. So therefore, when it goes into your home, when it goes into a museum space, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it while I was here, that it brought good energy. This was reborn number two. So you can see that by this point, um, I'm understanding some things. But reborn was really about, uh, first of all, it was about um, Kanye West and Kid Cudi had this song called Reborn, it was, um, he would say, keep moving forward, keep pushing forward. And it was this idea that I had about keep pushing forward past, um, like in transit, if you were like trying to figure it out and you just had to keep, keep pushing forward. But I wanted to excavate the pouches and I wanted to do something different with the pouches that I wasn't doing before. So I actually started sewing them directly to the surface and not having them hang off, that they became an additional line. Um, and then they became lines on top of on top of the fabric as well, going along with the curves, that were, the draping that was there. Um, this was number one. I started thinking about making the, pouch, the, the pouches smaller so they looked like they were kind of part of the work. Um, and, then, uh, and then still having the strings there, but I wanted them to kind of enhance the work in a different kind of way. And then you hear, now we're here. This is at the illustrious uh, Zuckerman Museum. Um, this piece was 15 feet by 20 feet. It was a monster. Um, I was telling Amanda yesterday about my love for the color purple um, and my love for prints. And I was telling her that I felt like when it came to this piece that if I was gonna make, if I was gonna die, right after I made this piece, that I would, the gift that I would wanna give to the world is purple. So I wanted to make something that was dynamically purple. My mom's favorite color is purple. She likes lavender. I like more of the eggplant purple, the darker purple. So this is actually layered with two different colors of purple. Um, this piece is in two pieces. Um, my wall in my studio is about 20 feet. So I had, I made one, it's 20 feet by like 10 feet. So I made one and then I had to make a second one which was extremely challenging because about halfway through I was like, I'm tired of looking at purple. Like I, I don't wanna see any more purple for a minute. And I had done something where I had blocked the lighting in my studio so then it started getting dark in there. I'm just like, oh my God, like how, what is this gonna be finished? And it took me like a month to finish because like I took a two week break in between and. And then I had to invite some friends over to help me do sewing because I was just like, it just became like a monster. 
Um, but we, we finished it, and it was beautiful, um, to me anyway. I thought it was tremendous, um, all the layering, all the colors, all the pouches. Um, and then I was playing with these ideas of knots in the pouches. Again, this idea of reborn was this idea of playing with these pouches and really um, making circular pouches. Um, so in between doing all that kind of stuff, I then go into uh, making paperwork. Um, this was an idea I had. I had an exhibition in Marietta, and I, um, I had some old paper pieces. I started off, when I started making art again, um, I told you I had a separation. There was a time where I spent six months in my mother's basement um, in between relate, uh, after relationships. And um, I was in my mother's sewing room on a pull-out sofa for like six months. And I was wondering what I was going to do with my life. Um, during one of my stints doing audiovisual, I went up to Tennessee and I saw these watercolor abstracts. And I said, I could do that. So I went the next day to Pearl. I bought 12-inch paper. I bought some watercolor paper, watercolor paper, I bought watercolor paints, and just started making. I started with 12 inches in my mother's basement. <laughs> then I needed more room in the basement. That was making 24, 18 by 24, then 32. Then I'm combining pieces. The same thing I do with sewing. Just like, just make one and keep making. And next thing you know, I had pieces drying outside while I'm making pieces inside, and it just became this thing. Well. 11 years after that, I go back after grad school and I said, I want these to kind of feel like my fabric pieces. So I had these two pieces of, these two pieces of um, watercolor paper and I said, well this one took me like a month to do and I was pulling, recycling old paintings and this one was for the new show. I said, yeah, but I want that color on here. I knew it took me a month to do, so I knew that it was impossible for me to do because I had two weeks left. I'm sure all of you understand that as art students, right? So I said, <sighs> and I tore it, and I glued it to the other piece, and I was like, that works. <laughs> okay, where's some more stuff to tear up? So then I start tearing and making these new pieces. I start making collages out of my own work. Um, now I don't have any of those old pieces, but now the way that I make it is I, I make these pieces and I make them ready to collage. Again, sampling. They've gotten larger. Yeah. And then this is uh, flat splat, just like that. Um, this investigation about shape, I don't really, and I recently looked at it again, I was in a museum and I saw that everything was square. And it was like the first time that, that I recognized in the same way I did then. I think it's because I've been fighting with myself and with other people about square paintings and thinking like, you know, as artists what we do, why aren't I receiving, and Instagram is the worst. Instagram is the worst. If you ever want to get down on yourself, just look at Instagram for a while. <laughs> because you'll look on there and be like, they're getting an award, why aren't I getting an award? I'm sitting here at home. There's an exhibition there yesterday, nobody asked me to go to that exhibition. I wanted to go. What, he's got another exhibition? Oh my God, he just had one two weeks ago. I'm sitting here at home watching Project One with my daughters. <laughs> So I was thinking to myself, like, about the square thing. And I started going, you know, so I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to my studio. I'm going to make some square paintings. I'm going to make a whole bunch of square paintings, and I'm going to give them to you. And then you're going, what? What? And then every time I go back to my studio, I go, I'm not making that. I don't want to make anything square. I don't want to make anything square. 
I want things to be natural. I want things to be as they are. I, wanna, I want you to feel like you're cutting something out of the sky. I want it to be just what it is. A lot of times we make, like even in these artist talks, like I've been told like sometimes I don't dress like an artist. I'm just like, you know what? I just care about the work. I just care about making the work. I want you to love the work. The way I dress, the way my hair is, all that stuff, it doesn't really matter. It's just how I make the work. So these canvases that you see here, are I call them found canvas. They are, because of the larger pieces that I make, I cut the canvas from behind them when I'm draping them. Um, and whatever that leftover canvas is, I then started sewing it together. And then I just had these canvases. I started kind of doing it like before COVID. And then when COVID happened, I had a big pile of them and then I had some old paintings from grad school that I had sewn together. And I was like, eh, eh, who knows? But you know, working artists, when you're working and you have deadlines, you don't have time to do that stuff. You don't have time to explore new ideas. You don't have time to push yourself. But then COVID happens. <laughs> and someone said, oh, we'll be in the house for a week. No. We were in the house for years. And the roads were clear. I could drive to my studio at 9 a.m. And I can come back home at 9 p.m. I was at the studio so much, my kids started going, do you have an extra family that we need to know about it? But I was in the studio, and the first thing I would do is I would turn on the movie The Wiz. Because it was a happy movie, and I was tired of hearing about people dying I was tired of hearing about someone who was a president tweeting. <laughs> like, don't you have other things to do? You have a hobby? So I'm thinking about all this kind of stuff. I'm just like, I don't want to think about that stuff. So let me go watch The Wiz. So for those of you who don't know, does anyone not know what The Wiz is? is it? OK. The Wiz is the black version of The Wizard of Oz and probably one of the greatest movies you'll ever see in your entire life. Just imagine Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, Nipsey Russell, Richard Pryor, Quincy Jones, all in one movie in the 70s, like 78. I remember when my parents took me to go see it, there was this thing where you used to get your hair picked out, but when you do it with a, uh, a hair dryer, then it's really fluffy. And I was eight years old going there. I was like, yeah, I'm going to see the Wiz. And then you see Michael Jackson up there, and he's the scarecrow. And he's saying, you can't win. And it, but when you're 50 in your studio and it's COVID, you need a Michael Jackson episode. You need a Diana Ross episode. You need dancing and singing to help you forget this imaginary world that doesn't really exist anywhere except for right here. And I would play it every day. I would sometimes, at the beginning, I was watching it two or three times in the day. And then I just started watching it once a day. And during that time, I took all these canvases, I just started painting on them. And I started painting on them in the same way that I paint on the textile paintings. But now you can see the layers. Where before, you really couldn't. I got to use oil paint sticks because you don't see those in the painting, but you still saw the spray paint. You still see the regular paint. I'm still using the oops paint. So the same way that I would fold them together and tape them, um, the fabric pieces, I did that with this fabric, with this textile. And, um, and then I began just painting on them and then they just became these things. And after about four of them, I started going, wait a minute, these are, kind of, these are kind of good. They're going somewhere. I like these. But also, because of watching The Wiz, I started thinking, well, what am I going to call it, right? And then I, I was watching The Wiz one day, and they were talking about the munchkins that came off the wall. And then he said, and there we were on the wall, flat, splat, just like that. I was just like, yeah, that's the title. <laughs> because it kind of dealt with this idea of this natural thing. There was these munchkins, these people that were on the wall as graffiti that was stuck on the wall in their own shape. And my paintings were 
very similar to that. That was number seven. This is Cosmotastic Black and Mansa Ordal. This is me taking the pouches off of the wall and then putting them into the world on their own. It's also this idea of this name that I, I'm using. I, we're so serious about art making all the time. I just wanted to make something that was fun. I just wanted to give a name that like, again, go back to the idea, if you can say the name, then maybe you'll be transported into that magical place. But I'm using these pouches in a different way, circ making them circular, adding pouches on top of the pouches as if they are growing as you're looking at them. Again, I'm not using the paint, but I am using spray paint. I am using um, red clay. And this was actually shown at the um, Cobb Museum. Yes. I got an opportunity to do some public art, and these were birdhouses. They're done at um, Avondale train station. Um, you can still see them. There was three that were broken because the tree limbs fell down on them, but it was this idea about taking that same color, those graffiti cutouts that I do that I put on the, um, um, on the paintings that I wanted them to be like Pletsy, I wanted you to be able to see through them, and I wanted that when the sun hit them, that they would almost act like stained glass. And that as the hours change in the day, you can see the color on the ground. And we accomplished it, and that was amazing. It's great to think about something, but it's really amazing that when it actually works, right? As artists, like you, coming up with these ideas and you're thinking, I don't know, let's try it. But it, it worked and doing them in different shapes and seeing them from different perspectives. Um, and then I did see birds in them, which was really wonderful too. I tried to select colors that birds would be attracted to as well. Um, and then I think someone asked me if I went to Charleston last summer. So last summer I went to Charleston, South Carolina. I was an artist in resident at the Gibbs Museum um, and I really wanted to take in the culture, um, kind of like what I'm doing here, is I don't like to really go to a new place and rehash ideas. I think that part of the art making journey is to sometimes put your hand behind your back, you know, tie your hand behind your back and then force yourself to a work in a different way. Um, use materials you haven't used before. So the only thing that I went to Charleston with was canvas. Um, other things was like when I went to Home Depot to get ooze paint, I went to Home Depot in Charleston. Um, when I went to buy art supplies, I bought my art supplies in Charleston because I wanted to use those local colors, the colors that they were deciding um, there. And then I started off doing these and they didn't have the color to them, but then I met a woman um, Ariana Comer, uh, uh, um, Comer King, and she does indigo. She came to the studio one day to meet me on the very first day. As a matter of fact, she waited for me to get there. Um, and we sat down and talked. She goes, come out to Wapala Island, and um, I do indigo out there. Maybe you could do some. I said, okay. So I took some of the canvases out there. I did some. I liked it. It was an amazing opportunity. Um, and then we sat there and talked. And since I was there for six weeks, I wasn't used to being in Charleston and I wasn't used to the environment and the people and I learned so much. Like, I learned that the first Africans that touched shore, they touched shore in Charleston, South Carolina. So, I found out before, the first time I went to Charleston, I went to Charleston with a friend and with some friends and we went there I thought it was really amazing. And then we went to the beach and I thought it was Folly Beach. We, we go to the beach, it was an absolutely beautiful beach. The sand, the water, I mean, it was really beautiful. And I said, I wonder if they have a residency here. Can you imagine getting paid to make artwork close to a beach? <laughs> when? <laughs> so I applied, I got it. I was like, this is dope. I said, let me go to Folly Beach. 
I was going to look for a place close to Folly Beach. I couldn't find one. It got really expensive, like $10,000, like six, six weeks. I'm like, y'all smoking. Um, <laughs> so I found a place. I was talking to a friend, and I said, um, which one would be better? We select, I selected the one on Mount Pleasant. The, the day I got there, I drove in. I went to um, Home Team, which was a barbecue place that was close by the beach that I remember going to. So I go to Home Team, I eat, I go to the beach afterwards. This is amazing, I'm right here. And then, now think, I fought to be at Folly Beach. I ended up on Mount Pleasant. I really didn't know where I was. I put in the, the Google map for where my hotel was. I was 11 minutes away from the beach. It was almost like the universe said, you don't know what you're talking about, I'm gonna put you where you're supposed to be. So I ended up at that same beach. I found out that this beach was actually the first where Africans first touched shore was Sullivan Island. Enslaved Africans touched shore. So I took the pieces and I put the pieces into the ocean and drove them around. And then I took them back and then I put them on the sand, let them sun dry, and then I took them to the studio. So they still had sand on them. They still had the remnants of the salt. After doing the, the indigo with my friend, um, I was going to take the indigo pieces and the pieces I had already and, and put them together, um, which was just raw canvas. And I realized, as I realized in this program with Amanda, the raw canvas really doesn't, isn't as pretty as you think it is um, when you put it next to that indigo. So, I went back and redid all the pieces, and then I ended up doing 10 pieces with this indigo that I had hand dyed myself. I hand dyed them, then I took them to the ocean, put them into the, into the water, dan loved around with them, then put them on the, on the beach, let them dry in the sun, and then took them to the studio, and then painted on them. So again, this is the same kind of thing I was using with the Flat Splat series, but I'm actually taking the, um, Spanish moss, and I'm putting that in the work. I'm using the palm free, putting that in the work, um, dragging that. I am d using mono print, which I had never done before, and I am calling upon Sai Tuam Lee to teach me how to paint again. Um, because most of the time, I think it's a maximalist, and I think that if you just put everything on there, then it's gonna eventually work out, and it normally does. But with this, I was really engaged with the indigo, and I want the indigo to show through the work. So I began to use monoprinting, and I used, I was more sparse with my mark making, um, more controlled with my mark making. And I thought that at the fourth one, this is again for those of you that are art students and art professionals, at the fourth one, I stood back from it, and I began to cry. And I began to cry because I began asking myself the questions of, will they get it? Will they understand it? Did I go too far? Did I not go far enough? And then um, I had a studio visit, and I told him, I said, man, it's so crazy that you came in here because, and he was like from the Smithsonian, and he said, and I said, man, I'm, you know, I, I just don't know what to think right now. He says, well, man, if you're going through those kind of emotions, it's gonna be really great. And I, and I hope that they are. But again, these odd-shaped canvas paintings, you know, have to find their way in the world. And I would say to you just real quick that as an artist, you have to trust yourself, someone who is constantly fighting with making square paintings, that they may not get it today. They may not get it tomorrow. It may take a while for them to get it. But someone's going to get it. Zuckerman got it. <laughs> so now we're here. Ah. Ah. So you've seen my journey with batiking. You've seen my journey with making color, with indigo. And now I'm finally at a place where I can make my own from scratch. I am a maker. I like making things from scratch.
And now, with the help of Amanda and Neil, who have taught me so much and been so generous with me, um, sitting down with me at the computer, teaching me Photoshop, um, making my prints for me before I get there, um, encouraging me, um, coming in and going, yeah, that's okay. And then uh, even making decisions like we tried the raw canvas and then when I made the other canvas, I said, this isn't white enough. I was able to go to Geo through Mary Beck, who's been, oh my God, Mary Beck. Oh, my patron saint. Um, um, but she was able to go to Geo and say, you know what, Jamel needs white canvas. And it was approved. And Jamel needs containers, approved. I feel, I feel loved, I feel loved. You know, the funny thing is, side note, I go to my family sometimes, I go, you know what, I go to residencies and they feed me and they ask me what I want. I go to galleries and they go, how do you want this hung? And they, they say, do you need water? They, they are thinking about me and I come home and you guys want me to take the trash out? I am a professional artist. I deserve to be treated as such. Get to work. As they're walking away going, whatever, Dad. But here, um, you guys have been so kind to me. Uh, I have 24-hour access to the studio, which I have been there sometimes till 10 o'clock. Last night I was there till 10 o'clock. Um, I had Maddie there yesterday, yesterday with me, stirring up some yellow for me. Um, so everyone's been really, really nice. And I am learning, as you see to the, the furthest left, you see me learning batiking on my own, using my own mark. And then you see the buckets of um, dye that I'm doing. I've been able to create these beautiful colors, some of them purposefully now, some of them accidentally, but they will all be used. So like these are, this is what I did yet last night. So these look really good and I, I'm not showing you the, the ones at the beginning. <laughs> they weren't bad, but they just weren't like now. I feel like I have really a handle on what's going on and then two weeks in, um, and I'm really, really grateful for that. I wish I had two more weeks. These are some of the patterns that I'm making um, using the, these are computer, um, computer imaging where I've taken some photographs from Charleston and cut out pieces, not all of it, and just kind of like um, made these little marks and then some of them are my hand drawn and just kind of playing around. And then the, the one in the middle um, and the one on the far end, the one on the far end has my hand but I also found this thing on, on Etsy where they were giving away, where they were selling these petite stamps. So I just kind of used them in my own way um, and have been able to develop these patterns. So the idea that I have for this next project is gonna be abstract. <laughs> um, I'm thinking more about the color yellow, a lot about yellow. I'm thinking about the way that we've used yellow in the past. I think about the fact that we think of yellow being this very bright, happy color, but oftentimes you can't really take yellow if you're staring at it for an hour. Um, I'm thinking about pattern and redoing patterns. I'm thinking about um, my own mark and how to use my own mark. I'm also thinking about this idea of painting without painting, meaning that everything's gonna be left on the surface. Um, I'm thinking about collaging in a different I'm thinking about making my own collages out of this fabric by these different stamps. There are things I'm not showing you. Um, and then I'm looking forward to this exhibition that's gonna happen here um, in the summer. Thank you so much. Did, do we wanna do any questions? Yes, 
School of Visual Arts. Oh, did you? Wonderful. Okay. Right. That's what's really great about that school. No. No, it was the, every artist, especially if you're here in Georgia and lived here in Georgia, and I, I was, like I told you, I'm originally from Ohio, grew up in Dayton. In Dayton, we didn't really have, I didn't have any artists that I can see and know, okay, that's an artist. I didn't go to a studio and know, okay, well, that's how you're supposed to have a studio. So the goal is to compete with New York. So the opportunity to go to New York and compete with the artists that are the artists of the artists. I wanted to be in the playing field, and I wanted to compete with them, and I wanted to know that I could. And, and to your point, the people that I had in my studio, I had um, um, Miguel Luciano, I had Sheila Pepe, who's become a friend, Dave McKenzie, I have Rico Gaston, I have uh, Micheline Thomas, was, in, was one of my studio professors. Um, I mean, that's just, Marilyn Minter was one of my crit professors. Uh, she was awesome too. Um, and Micheline was so, so generous. Um, there was just a number of these people who, uh, Dred Scott, um, Mark Gibson, just a number of people who really poured into me. Um, uh, that I, I, Camilla Rashid, I mean just, and then them just walking through, like Seth Rodney was there, who's a art writer. He became a personal friend. Um, I became friends with Deborah Jack and Ebony G. Patterson. And um, I mean, just, I became friends with all these people because of being in New York. And having that kind of experience around you, you have one critique that's coming from your professors, but then you get another critique by meeting professional artists in that world, and then you become something else, right? And that's what I went there to do. I went there to see the work, be around the work, commit myself to the work, and to be, um, and to make friends with people who were professionals that would elevate me. Yeah, and you know, and I had my own studio, and they kind of give you free reign, like to, for you to create what you want to create. So I went there, making wood sculptures and I came out making textile paintings. And that's the way grad school should be, actually. Um, for those of you that are thinking about grad school, when you go to grad school, you go there because you've mastered some smaller things, but when you get to go to your masters, then it's a lot of time of thinking. Like I spent, I would be in the studio till sometimes three, four o'clock in the morning, easily. I kept a second set of clothes, with a bar of soap and a washcloth and deodorant and toothpaste in my little locker, because I would sometimes I wouldn't even go home sometimes for three or four days. Yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, inhale the acrylic. <laughs> <laughs> you got a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, actually. Um, Stem Gilliam, of course, you can't help but not like his work, and of course, we're in the same conversation. But the person I really look to is Al Loving. And I like Al Loving the most, and Al Loving, I feel like looking at his practice, because every now and again I see a new Al Loving, I'm like, okay, so I'm on the right, I'm on the right train, right? I'm, I'm going on the right path. Like, I did see, when I was in DC, I saw a Sam Gilliam that I was really attracted to that was um, a collage. And I was like, wow, this is really amazing. This is really amazing. And then I saw Sam Gilliam and I said, why, of course. Because it reminded me of another level of what I'm making. And that's what you'll also see, like 
people who are connected to you and you don't realize. So yes, Sam Gilliam is that person. El Naltusue is one of those people, but Al Loving and Thornton Dahl are probably my two biggest influences. Um, I have my top five, which is uh, Thornton Dahl, um, Thornton Dahl, Basquiat, Pollock, Cy Twombly, uh, Melvin Edwards. The dyes are synthetic. Um, I actually introduced Amanda to someone who makes natu yeah. who does natural dyes, and hopefully we can bring her here to, to um, as part of the program, um, and that's 10%. Um, and <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, but as far as color, I do have an overall idea about color, and because I've been playing around with it for a while, and when I say play, I, I'm I use that term loosely um, because it really is work to get a color. Like uh, Amanda, when I first started, she would talk about a recipe. And I didn't understand what she meant by a recipe, but after doing it the past couple of weeks and doing it over and over again, I'm realizing, like yesterday I was able to make a lighter yellow and a darker yellow. And that to me was an accomplishment because I was able to see that the amount of dye you need to make this color and the time it needs to be spent in there. And then by the end, I started putting in some things that were from other color into that one. I hadn't washed it off enough and that color began getting into the other dye. So I was learning like how these things influence each other. Um, so, and my color wheel is very different than everyone else's and I love mistakes. So I have an overall idea that I, I want to accomplish, and that is this color of yellow and the way it's used, and seeing how I can get that yellow in. And I made another experiment in there where I took, excuse me, other colors that I had, sewn them together, and then all put them in yellow together to see how they would look. Um, and I only did that for like 30 minutes just to kind of get my mind ready for what's going to happen next. So I am thinking about color um, more than just painting, but using the color. We use color as paint in a traditional way of, I can dip in here and say, this is yellow, this is blue, I'm gonna use this color, cool color, like that. But when you're making color, I don't know if I'm correct, but from what I'm getting so far, when you're making color, it's a different kind of thinking because you're using different colors to make that color. So you're not thinking about it in the same way of dipping here and dipping there. You're thinking about what is gonna be the outcome, what is the recipe to make this color, so I am, Boy, look at me, look at me, I'm over here dancing, right? Um, but I, I've really learned a lot. Uh, what was your biggest like, challenge when you first started your art journey, and how did you overcome that? Ah, uh, my biggest challenge in my art journey. Uh, when I was young, I used to draw a lot, draw a lot of graffiti, draw comic book characters, but it's easy when you're young because um, that's all you have. When you get older, and I started my practice, again, like I said, I started at kind of 38, um, and that's another reason why I like uh, Thornton Dahl. He started at 69, he gives me hope. Maybe by 69 I'll be as good as he is. Um, but my biggest obstacle was to take it serious that, that the, the person that I am as an artist is the person I've always been and I've denied it. Like I felt like when I went to grad school, I was coming out of the closet, like I am an artist. Like um, I will tell you even more personal, like my mother was really upset that I was going to New York. I mean, really upset. Um, you leaving these kids behind. The mothers were like, you abandoning these kids. 
and I knew it was a calculated risk. I knew that what I was doing was gonna make me a better person. I knew that I was gonna be happy with myself for the first time in my life. And not that I was upset with myself, but just like I was really fulfilling who I am naturally, as opposed to trying to be what other people wanted me to be. Um, and that is one of the hardest things that you have to learn as a person in this world, is how to be and how to honor yourself. Um, so, when I left and went to New York, I mean, my mother hung up on me when I, when I'm on the when I'm on the way to New York, and she was like, "You know, you said you're gonna be a blah," and I was like, "Well, you know, you can't really hang up on people anymore. Now you have to go like this. It's not as fun. We used to hang up angry like these sound effects, and now you just go, Doop. are you there? Are you there? It's no more fun." But she hung up on me, but when I got there, she realized that um, I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And now, now, five years later, she's, when I received, I was a finalist for the Hutchinson Prize, she was able to come to me and say, you know what, you did the right thing. This is the person I always thought you would be. Thank you very much.